There's a great deal of fascination and really emphasis that you see in the NAR on signs and wonders. It, it draws you to see what the scripture has said about those very same things. A group of people came to Jesus saying, will you show us a sign? And Jesus has a correction for them. We read in Matthew chapter 16, verse 1 tells us, The Pharisees and the Sadducees came testing him and asking if he would show them a sign from heaven. And Jesus answered and said to them, When it is evening, you will say, It will be fair weather, for the sky is red. In the morning, it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and threatening. And then he calls them hypocrites. And he says, You know how to discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. And then he says, A wicked and an adulterous generation seeks after a sign. Now, he not only chastises them for wanting to see parlor tricks or some kind of a show, something sensory, but he also tells them, I will give you a sign, just not like what you're expecting. Now, you can recognize how the weather is going to be tomorrow, but you can't even recognize that the physical representation of God in the flesh stands right in front of you. You're oblivious to who I am and what I represent. So the one sign that I will give for you is the sign of the prophet Jonah. He was as good as dead, three days gone, and came back to life. The message of repentance is what the people in Nineveh heeded and for a hundred years. There was that removal of that judgment because they did repent. Jesus' message to them would be just like Jonah's. You will see me put to death as well as dead for three days. I will return. The message is one of repentance, not of signs and wonders. In being involved in this for 20 years, I, uh, I was addicted. I've, I've always had an addiction issue, and I traded him one addiction to the other, and this new high was, I thought, God's answer to, to my addiction <laughs> because I became addicted to it. Though when I read the Bible, I read about testing the spirits, but it never occurred to me to do that because I was so caught up in the power and the sensations that were happening that it changed your reality. It really did with each encounter that you had with that, your reality began to change and your thought process was changing and evolving into um, this new belief system. But in it, I lost the real love and the real sweetness and goodness of God and I took the artificial sweetener that causes cancer, that kills. Jesus came to give us life and to give us love to care for humanity. Though this looks like and they say that it's they care, it's a very self-centered belief system that is, operates on lust, the lust of the flesh. Another aspect of this renewal um, was the signs and wonders that would appear in the conferences. Um, gold dust would appear on people's faces. What I, the gold dust that I experienced, I would just see specks of gold on their face as like glitter. It would look like glitter on their faces. And they were saying the gold teeth were appearing. I never saw the gold teeth. I saw feathers falling from the sky and I saw oil um, coming out of uh, a person's hand, oil just coming out of their hands. And there were also he these incredible healings that we were hearing about. People were being healed of cancer and, and um, legs were growing out and all these things. I never personally, though I had been around this for 20 years, saw anyone healed ever. I've seen a lot, I saw a lot of people go up for the healings. I saw a lot of manifestations of the spirits on their body just as I had experienced it when I went up for healing, but was never personally healed. Burden, that there come an anointing that would break through. This is the day for breakthrough. This is the day. I'd never been comfortable with Todd Bentley because there were just certain people in that circuit that reminded me of the devil worshipers that I saw in, up in Oregon. 
and they just had that presence about them. So I was never real comfortable with him. Todd Bentley boasts that he can lay hands on the sick and that he's raised people from the dead and, uh, you know, the power that he has. You know, there's nothing he can't do with this power that he has. And he displays the power. I mean, the power hits you, the uh, knocks you down, makes you drunk, the laughter, all these typical signs that you see in the Bethel church. Um, all these physical manifestations happen in his services. Aren't you drunk in the Holy Ghost? Drunk in the Holy Ghost? Fire! When I was going through to the Bethel things, we would testify that, yes, indeed, we had uh, been touched by God and we thought we were healed because we had these physical manifestations and we felt the power hit us, which we believed was God. When we would get home, we would realize that we weren't healed. And they would teach, like even with Benny Hinn, was that, you know, maybe you didn't feel like you were healed at the time, but that your healing would come. Sometimes your healing was a process, but you totally believed that you were healed. So you would get up and you'd get, they would make you come up and give these testimonies that you were healed. And you believed you were healed because you had a physical force of power go through your body. I have visited many guru ashrams, that means Hindu retreat centers in India, and probably one of the most impressive compounds was Satya Sai Baba's main ashram in Andhra Pradesh, India. He's the guru, by the way, who said, I am God and you too are God. The only difference between you and me is that while I am aware of it, you are completely unaware. He is famous for signs and wonders around the materialization of the booty holy ash, said to endow prosperity and burn away all sins. The booty holy ash is considered the most precious object in a spiritual sense. Materializing objects is performed by NAR prophets who display gold dust, feathers, and oil to millions of Christians claiming they bring posterity healing and wealth. Many disappointed NAR followers' warnings and their disenchantments can be read on the internet. In India, one only has to see the poverty and ill health among Hindu followers of gurus to realize signs and wonders, both East and West, delude the followers who rationalize their addiction and overlook the fakery of religious pretenders. The Bible warns, woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. It never made me question that it was fake because I felt the sensations, I felt the power in the room. And I believe, I believe that power could make anything happen. So I never questioned it. I read about testing the spirits, but I never, that never, never occurred to me. It never occurred to me to do that because I was so caught up in the, the power and the sensations that were happening that it changed your reality. It really did. With each encounter that you had with that, your reality began to change and your thought process was changing and evolving into um, this new belief system and something that I would always experience and that was in our church Would be entities there and we were told they were angels I would feel them when you would touch them They were po they were standing around in the services and I could literally sense them I could feel them and when I would touch them sensations would go through my body when the topic of angels comes up we know that there are innumerable numbers of, of angels, but we don't know very many of them by name. Actually, only a few. Gabriel is one that is mentioned. Michael is one that is mentioned. Those would be seen as, as godly angels, ones who have kept fidelity to Jehovah God. But then there is Lucifer. We now call him Satan. Uh, we know that a third of the angels fell with him in his rebellion. So the idea that there are angels that are, uh, if you will, sympathetic towards Satan. And then there are also those who serve God who never rebelled. Angels are coming, not holy angels, not Michael, 
Satan transforming himself into an angel of light and he's whispering into people's ears and because they're open to those things because they haven't studied to show themselves approved workmen who need not to be ashamed because they don't have the real Holy Spirit in them because they are power hungry they're allowing these things to influence them I believe these are sincere men but they are sincerely wrong John Crowder is um, also another prophet operating with the prophets that are out of Bethel Crowder had come to our church several times and he's probably best known for Token the Ghost where he puts his hands together and like he's going to smoke a joint and he's inhaling this spirit which he equates to just smoking marijuana and uh, getting stoned. So at, with each time that he sucks the air in, he becomes more and more intoxicated. And there's a lot of manifestations around him because he uh, he encourages you to, to really get hammered. He calls it getting hammered. What we call getting drunk in the spirit, he calls getting hammered. And with each breath that he took in, pretending that he was smoking a joint, would be equivalent to each person imparting that power to you. So with each toke, the more hammered he would get, we would say we were getting drunk. But when he came to our church, the thing that I noticed was it was all about glorifying getting hammered or token the ghost or getting high on God. And it was like he was going to win these followers that were doing drugs by giving him this drug that was way better than the drug that they were using, which troubled me because it was, to me, he was glorifying being on drugs. So he, he would come and then he would encourage us all after the service, after we all got hammered, drunk, whatever we called it, and uh, crawl around on the floor and laughter and all these signs. And we called them signs and wonders when we would get in that intoxicated state. He would encourage us all to go out to witness on the streets. So I thought, well, this will be interesting. I just want to see what goes on. How does he win these kids? Because he's always boasting how he's bringing all these kids and this is his ministry. So we go out to the coffee shop and I'm sitting there and I'm watching them. And, um, and I was amazed at what I was hearing him say because he never said anything other than this is better than drugs. This is, you can get high on this. And he kept just saying, you can get high on this. And I thought, this is really perverted to me. I didn't see, what was he lifting up? He was lifting up getting high. The uh, NAR is very much youth oriented. We see it especially with uh, Mike Bickle and the IHOP movement. Very much at the heart of the NAR is an appeal and an outreach to the youth who genuinely, if you were to ask them, love the Lord, but they're given counterfeit. They are given experience. They are given those, what they would see as tangible things that are not biblical. They're not being pointed by these churches to read the Word of God, to find out whether or not the experience is valid or reasonable. They don't point them to the Scripture in any way at all. They point to the signs and the wonders as its own self-evidence. They don't have the, the Scripture as their guide. From there, once they have them believing that they are part of this kingdom work that is going on, they see themselves as being able to usher in that kingdom, which is contrary to Jesus' own teaching. In Bible-believing churches, we understand that the Holy Spirit's at work. He's drawing men to Christ. He indwells us at salvation. He comes upon us to give us those giftings and that power to, to do the things that Christ has asked us to do. But we don't make the emphasis on the Holy Spirit. Jesus said when the Holy Spirit comes, He won't speak of Himself. He's going to glorify Christ. He's going to give us a greater understanding of Christ. He's the Spirit of truth. He's going to guide us and lead us into all truth. And the greatest work of the Holy Spirit is when you open your Bible and you're reading, that spirit of truth is working in your mind and in your heart to make sure that we understand and rightly divide the Word of God. The promise to them is that this new generation of youth, as they gather them in these conferences, they talk to them about being unique. There's never been a generation like you. You're that end time apostle and you're that end time move of the Holy Spirit and you're unique. There's never been anyone quite like your generation. Now you say that enough times to that group of people, then they start to believe that there's something is unique about them. 
that they are somehow different and there's never been anybody quite like them. Now you tell them that they will also be empowered with giftings and signs and wonders superior to anything that had been seen before. It's intoxicating. It's something that will get quite a, uh, quite a, in their words, a revival going. People excited about them being part of something that is unique and never, never been seen before. My husband and I were originally part of the vineyard movement when it first started until we realized how apostate and how far from biblical understanding this organization was. John Wimber, head of the Vineyard Churches, said himself to me when I brought to his attention the demonic manifestations and encounters and the people he was recommending who were hardcore, well-known channelers and occultists, he said to me, there, there, dear, our God is bigger than your big, bad, old devil. The Holy Spirit will straighten it out. We don't want to quench the new young prophets by asking them to test it. Yet if you don't test it, how do you know that the voice in your head is really God? How do you know the message you sincerely claim and believe to be from Jesus is from Jesus? Jesus calling first published in 2004 is a daily devotional inspirational reading authored by Sarah Young who earned her master's degree in counseling and biblical studies at Covenant Theological Seminary and has introduced millions upon millions of Christians into many occult and new age practices as though they were biblically approved. Unless you have a solid source of absolute truth truth that is true regardless of what you may think about it, truth from God against which to test your experiences, there is no way of testing it. The occultist means of testing is very empirical, very pragmatic. If the information you are receiving is good, it's from God. If the feelings and the experiences you have seem uplifting and encouraging, it's from God. Bringing the concept of testing the spirits to the Christian church today, the apostate Christian church, the new apostolic reformation, and the, all the new apostles and prophets, they will tell you, as did John Arnott, head of the Toronto Blessing Church, don't even consider the possibility you might be deceived. As long as you're sincere, you can't be. NAR theology says God is being restricted by fundamentalist Christianity that places too much emphasis on the authority of God's word as being more important than spiritual experiences, which they claim can be accessed by any who wish to bypass biblical thinking and cognitive intellect and tap into spirit power, also known as quantum mysticism, that they mistake as Holy Spirit power. In a book called The Physics of Heaven, NAR proponents say many in the church have tended to write off all dabblings into quantum mysticism as blasphemous and demonically inspired. However, there are a few courageous Christians, they say, who are beginning to speak up and say, wait a minute, there may be some God truth there that really belongs to us and that we should know about. Despite what Christians in the NAR movement say, they are not being courageous by dabbling into New Ageism, but are indeed involved in rebellion and are turning millions to what Hinduism, Eastern mysticism, and Gnosticism have always taught that spirit experiences from the spirit world that bring power is good. But Proverbs defines the rebellion as there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Eastern mysticism teaches experiences rooted in the five traditional senses of hearing, seeing, smelling, touching, and tasting belong to the gross world or the material realm which is not identified as reality. Rather, it's understood to be the unreal dimension or Maya. Mysticism informs the subtle world is beyond the five senses 
and is a sixth sense perceived to be reality. When developed through yoga discipline or activated through any mental stimulation resulting in altered states, the so-called subtle dimension brings spiritual experiences. Hindu teachings say humankind is in spiritual ignorance and darkness unless it's dispelled by radiance, light, spiritual knowledge, etc. through involvement in spiritual practices or insights given by spiritual masters. One guru from Mumbai, India, Dr. Jayanth Balaji Athavele, by profession a consultant clinical hypnotherapist, was once an atheist. He converted to Hinduism after discovering that many of his sick patients who had little chance of recovery successfully regained good health after performing certain Hindu rituals under the guidance of spiritually evolved persons he called saints, but in actuality their gurus who imparted various paths of Eastern mysticism. Soon, what Dr. Athavale realized was that the science of spirituality was far superior to physical and psychological science which leaves out the entire spiritual dimension. Through the guidance of his guru, Bhaktaraj Maharaj, the doctor became involved in Eastern philosophy and contacted the spirit world through Hindu disciplines such as mental contemplation, holy breathing, visualization, etc. These awakened him to supposedly divine consciousness and higher levels of knowledge. These experiences he spreads today by giving lectures on them as what he calls the science of spirituality. What's happening is that mystics credit benefits associated with spirit world contact as being scientific, attempting to credit supernatural powers as being worthy because they work. In actuality, we know demons have power to perform, but involvement in their powers is prohibited by the biblical God who knows of the resulting dangers that not only have consequences in our physical life, but for all eternity. The supernatural world can't be measured through orthodox scientific methods because science measures the natural world with observable physical evidence through observation or experimentation under controlled conditions. Demonic works are based on their characteristics. They're liars, divisive, destroyers, seducers, etc. They are not controllable or observable. Therefore, mystics' classifications come under the heading of pseudoscience. Only God, who is spirit and truth, can truthfully explain the spirit realm. Truth is a person. Jesus says he was truth and said his spirit was truth. He also said the Father and he were one. The existence of a triune God, three persons in one, is explained in the Bible. However, there are also spirit entities called angels who were created by God. And because God is perfect, at one time all creation was perfect too. Some angels remain obedient to God and worship him and do his bidding and are his ministering angels. But the Bible explains that a third of the angels rebelled against God when they followed Lucifer, described as an angel of light. These are today fallen angels who are anti-God, anti his word of authority, filled with confusion, lies, division, mayhem, and so on. Mystics who follow these spirits are doomed to delusion, seduction, bondage, and ultimate destruction. Many within Christianity misinterpret the biblical explanation of the devil or his rebels and fall prey to their lies, getting hooked into harnessing demonic powers for their own gain. In the Physics of Heaven book, about nine NAR leaders, described as a Holy Spirit think tank, gave their opinions to authors Judy Franklin and Ellen Davis, who assembled this so-called team of seers to reveal mysteries based on their spirit experiences 
to equip NAR followers into what they term as the fullness of Pentecost. These NAR prophets give their insights of a so-called God hidden in sound, light, vibrations, frequencies, energy, and quantum physics. Sadly, their search for the personal God of the Bible cannot be found in the impersonal forces of sound, light, vibrations, energy, and quantum physics. They are leading millions to the impersonal energy found within Hinduism and New Age One Worldism. The biblical Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are completely sufficient in the purity and holiness of their relationship with each other. God says he is love and is able to identify himself as such because the triune God is involved in a triune relationship. The impersonal consciousness of Hinduism that attempts to explain itself as love and truth cannot be such because those emotions must be based on relationship or couldn't exist. NAR theology is captivating millions into its mystical New Ageism for the furtherance of an end-time agenda for NAR dominionism. In the foreword of The Physics of Heaven, NAR prophet Chris Vallotton, senior associate pastor of Bethel Church in Redding, California, an overseer at Bethel's School of Supernatural Ministry, expounds on the NAR message of his fellow false teachers, saying, through their collective intelligence, these seers have emerged with new perspectives never before pondered. Actually, these so-called new perspectives have been furthered for thousands of years by seers usually associated with the dark powers of sorcery and divination. Chris and his wife Kathy believe, as do thousands in the NAR movement, that they are fulfilling God's mandate to train, equip, and raise up the coming Elijah generation, a company of bride warriors for the end-time harvest that will hasten the return of Jesus Christ. In reality, these aspirations are achieved by attaching to and working with spirit powers of dominion. The book's premise suggests there is a good side of the New Age and that Christians must redeem back the sea of quantum light that undergirds everything, and more importantly, we need to know how to access it. Interestingly, similar to NAR theology, the divinity of Hindu mysticism sees everything as one and as a consciousness able to be accessed. New Age spirituality also abounds with books about pursuing the God-like energies for mystical encounters, healing powers, and oneness with the divine. Further similarities existing between New Ageism and NAR theology gets even more confusing as the physics of heaven explains for every counterfeit there has to be a real version. Whenever you see a counterfeit, it says, it means a real exists, and that a lie just proves the existence of a truth. Therefore, the book argues, the New Age has counterfeited Bible teachings, which courageous Christians today are attempting to recapture. Author Ellen Davis says, she decided to investigate and bring my scientific background and my faith in Jesus Christ into the mix of my search for truth, I decided to examine New Age thought and practice for anything precious that might be extracted from the worthless. Now we are hearing more Christians taking back truths. Herein lies the danger. Davis searching for truth outside the Bible, yet purporting to have faith in Jesus Christ, uses her scientific background to formulate a Christianized spiritual science similar to Dr. Athavale. And because she doesn't have a high regard of the Bible as the inerrant word of God, gets compromised by rebellious spirits and their lying doctrines. Holy Scripture commands, come out from among them 
and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. Another NAR prophet and contributing seer to Davis's book, Jonathan Welton, says he, quote, found throughout scripture at least 75 examples of things that the New Age has counterfeited, such as having a spirit guide, trances, meditation, auras, power objects, clairvoyance, clairaudience, and more. These actually belong to the church, he says, but have been stolen and cleverly repackaged. Now, whenever you see a counterfeit, I hope you'll ask yourself, what is that a counterfeit of? What is its source? How can I have the authentic? Twisting scripture to accommodate a lie is common practice with occultists and is, of course, what Satan did when he tried to tempt Jesus Christ after his 40 days of fasting in the wilderness. Jesus Christ responded with the authority of the spirit of truth a crucial concept for Bible-believing Christians today who want to be discerning and fend off lying spirits. I thought that the lying spirits were good and anyone that came against the lies were bad because we were taught that. We were taught that if anyone came against our belief system, they had a religious spirit and that they were bad. They just didn't know. They didn't know the new thing. They were stuck. They had God in a box, and this is what we were taught, that this whole movement was to get God out of the box, that Christians had always kept God in a box, and they didn't allow him to do all these new things that he was capable of. So we had opened this box and let God out, and he was doing all these new things. Pandora's box. One of the things that has been most heartbreaking is watching well-meaning Christians who are prominent in the Christian world, whether they are pastors or like Todd Bentley, an evangelist out of the New Apostolic Reformation, is that they are assuming now a place of openness in which another spirit is coming and working through them, if you will, channeling through them and producing manifestations that have nothing to do with anything you see anywhere in Scripture, Old or New Testament, except with the demonized. Thinking they are hearing the voice of God, what they are doing is channeling angels of light who are demons masquerading as the Spirit of God. The teachings they are given are contrary to Scripture, and the manifestations are a display of blasphemous buffoonery that can only be described to the demonic. And yet they're assuming they are channeling God. And in fact, one pastor actually said to me, we have become channels for God. Mike Bickle, for all of his new signs and wonders and all of the Holy Spirit and the charismatic things, he's also dabbling very, very heavily in Eastern mysticism and Middle Age mysticism found in Catholicism. So that merger that's going on with him and what he's promoting through IHOP and the university and his own teachings are merging the new charismatic with the very old ritualistic mystical practices of the Middle Ages. Even looking at the books that he recommends through his website or the bookstore at, uh, at IHOP, you'll find selections from uh, Teresa of Avila. You'll find Richard Foster in the Celebration of Discipline, which is very ancient mysticism through Catholicism and even Eastern meditative thought. Prophet Mike Bickle, founder of the Kansas City Fellowship and the International House of Prayer Movement, is considered by many to be mainstream. His revelation from supposedly God received in Egypt, mandating him to change the understanding and expression of Christianity, is coming to fruition through his IHOP University and IHOP Bookstore, which promotes Roman Catholic mysticism and New Age Gnosticism to millions. A new understanding and expression of Christianity is certainly being ushered in, but tragically, it is feeding into a new world order and religion. Bickle's Kansas City Fellowship initially drew many together who believed that they had prophetic giftings from the Holy Spirit and became known as the Kansas City Prophets. 
After linking with John Wimber, mystical manifestations became commonplace in what was called the Metro Vineyard in Kansas City. Today, the NAR movement has morphed into a hotbed for teachings about mysticism. Prophet James Gall, for instance, an advocate of Seven Mountain theology and the release of powers for dominionism, who, by the way, rejects the rapture teaching because it opposes the staying behind to take dominion of the earth for the second coming of Jesus, is a member of the Harvest International Ministries apostolic team, director of Prayer Storm, and author of the book Dream Language, available in Mike Bickle's IHOP bookstore. The product description says, after centuries of neglect, the church is rediscovering the realm of dreams and visions as a legitimate avenue for receiving divine revelation. Such thinking shows James Gall to be a mystic who admits he gets mystical revelation through what he calls downpourings from the Holy Spirit. One downpouring, he claims, promoted a third great awakening, the greatest youth awakening in the world. He has written numerous books about societal transformation and revival through the use of occult practices such as angelic encounters, visitations to heaven, extra-biblical revelations through visions and dreams, and what is termed as the shifting of a mindset to unleash the prophetic. James Gall is a contemplative who writes in his study guide on consecrated contemplative prayer, I wish to express thanks to our Lord for the writings of Richard Foster. Richard Foster popularized Roman Catholic rituals that seek transformation by entering altered states of consciousness and call his discipline spiritual formation. By the 1980s, the spiritual formation movement that is a channel for contemplative prayer flooded into evangelical denominations and is today rampant within the NAR movement. Its foundational claim is to bring Christians into a deeper connection with God. However, rather than furthering the biblical method to teach the Word of God, spiritual formation teaches mystical experiences through spirit encounters and ecstasies in a process called getting into the presence. Eastern mysticism teaches one must go within to find God, but the Bible says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Obviously, venturing inwards for the presence of God is not biblical. It is easy to see how evangelical and Pentecostal Christians tend towards Roman Catholic mystics like St. Teresa of Avila from Spain whose name, incidentally, I took as my confirmation name when I was seven years old for my first Holy Communion ceremony while still a practicing Roman Catholic. Teresa claims she rose from the lowest stage of recollection while doing her devotionals of silence to the highest stages, joining in perfect union with God during her devotions of ecstasy, which were accompanied by rich experiences in the blessings of tears. Such mystical expressions occur during Hindu serpent power awakenings, but it's more digestible for Christians to label such ecstasies as coming from the presence of Jesus Christ rather than give the credit to the snake. Roman Catholic priest Thomas Keating said of Kundalini, in Christian spirituality, the unfolding of the stages of prayer described by St. Teresa of Avila in the interior castle may be the fruit of the kundalini energy arising under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. I know what it's like to have ecstatic, magnificent, beautiful, uplifting experiences that even as you're reading the Word of God suddenly you're saying, oh God, I want to be in your presence, and you feel yourself taken up, and suddenly you think you're in the third heaven, face to face with God, and having an encounter with beings that are ecstatic 
in the experiences they're producing and glorious in their manifestation. And I was convinced that these experiences were from God. Why? Because my only means of testing it was my subjective experience. It felt so different from all the frightening evil things that I'd encountered as a young woman and as a child. The feeling was so different. It was producing good fruit. I was no longer as afraid or as terrified as I used to be. I would invoke this Jesus in my special place of silence, my psychic laboratory that is identical to the place of silence of the emerging church and the contemplative movement. And I would simply weave this white light of Jesus, of the Christ around me, and I knew I was safe. This glorious experience of this Jesus within me was slowly shifting my understanding of who Jesus was to a cosmic Jesus, a Jesus who accepted everyone and everything. And I had another Jesus who was teaching me another gospel and was being very compliant in giving me manifestations from another spirit. That's exactly what I see happening in the Pentecostal Church, the New Apostolic Reformation, the latter reign, the manifested sons of God, all branches of radical Pentecostalism that's moved into Dominionism. They think they're contacting Jesus, but they're contacting an angel of light. In the early 90s, when we saw the Holy Laughter movement, it was a brand new thing. Nobody had ever seen anything like it. It was seen as so extreme, it was charismatic, and it was really enthralling to the people that were watching it. Interestingly enough, though, it has become very, very run-of-the-mill now. The problem with the pursuit of mysteries, the pursuit of signs, the pursuit of wonders, it has the same effect of people who take drugs. Whatever is working great now is not going to work so great tomorrow, so you go to the next strongest thing that you can find. If you would have said back in the 90s during the holy laughter that down the road people are going to talk about teleporting, they're going to talk about people who will levitate, wind up in two different places halfway across the globe, being caught up into the heavens, being raptured, and having throne room experiences, they would have been laughed at. Now people are paying money to hear people speak about these things and help to initiate them into such practices. The pursuit of mysticism really has no end as we're seeing now. Whatever was strong today is just run of the mill tomorrow. In our English language, we have a word bait. What it basically is, you can put it on a fish hook, you can put it in a trap of any kind, but it's supposed to lure in the person with something that they want, something they can see or something that they can taste to them that is tangible. What we have is an entire generation of these new prophets, new apostles, laying out bait for people all over the place, something that is appealing to them. Nothing that would warn the people that what they're about to ingest or about to take could lead to their ultimate peril. The people that are baiting the trap are just as deceived as the people that are eating the bait because it's the devil who sprung the trap.